My guest today is Jessica Leon, lead data scientist at Zurich and president of the Casualty Actuarial Society. Jessica has had a variety of roles in consulting at insurers and, near and dear to my heart, as a reinsurance broker. Jessica, welcome to the show. Great, David, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. First question, you work in the data science these days, and there's a lot of, I don't know, angst, or there was at one point, of the collision of data scientists and actuaries, and I'm wondering, what is the state of your thinking on what an actuary is today? Yeah, great question. Um, we've been giving that a lot of thought, the leadership at the Casualty Actuarial Society, and we have a new Envision future that we rolled out just in November of last year. Right. And this is our vision for the actuary and the profession going forward. It's that we are sought after globally for our ability to apply data and analytics to solve insurance and risk management problems. Okay. That is the vision. So it's very broad and it speaks to it speaks to this it speaks to the space that we play in in a very actionable way, right? If, if you look at our old Envision future at the Casualty Act Rail Society, it said something about how we, we're really about advancing the practice and application of actuarial science, which frankly we thought was very circular. It wasn't a really sure. good way of defining what we do, right? Actuaries do actuarial science is not helpful. Uh, so we wanted to put out something that was more evergreen and something that provided some direction, right? So whatever analytics you need to actually solve the important insurance problems, that's what actuaries need to be able to do. Okay. Now, what's interesting about that is that that does not exclude other people from doing the business of actuaries, right? So there's nothing about that which is proprietary to actuaries. You know, you can be a non-actuary and living out that definition every day. Tell me about that. Is there a tension there? Is there not? Does it matter? <laughs> Should we care? Yeah, good question. Um, and look, if I look at my own, my colleagues and my team at Zurich, certainly there are actuaries and also non-actuaries on the team, right? Mm -hmm. And if I look at the non-actuaries and the data scientists on my team, certainly they are also solving insurance problems using data and analytics, right? So I think there is room for us all and there is enough there are so many opportunities, frankly, to solve business problems using data yep. and analytics um, that, yeah, I don't think that there is that tension, as you say. So if you take, if I, as I'm thinking about this problem uh, or this question, anyway, it's not necessarily a problem. Uh, I don't need, mean to suggest that it has to be a problem. Thinking about the question, there is a very narrow, like legalistic definition of an actuary, which is somebody who signs off on financial statements, right? There's a like regulatory authority, which is yeah. imbued on actuaries that they can do certain things that, you know, regular normies can't do. And so that's like another possible definition. And then there's another one too, which is kind of related to that, but not in, which is actuaries are people who follow the code of conduct, right? And it's interesting the code of conduct, the code of conduct doesn't talk about analytics, right? So. It's almost as though if you go through the code of conduct, it's, it's like a independent, completely independent definition of actuaries than the one you gave, right? So yours is focused on the daily practice of actuary. Well, one aspect of it, which is analytically analytical thinking. And if you, you know, if you take the exams, you could be forgiven for thinking that actuaries are analysts every day, all day. But if you read the code of conduct, you would have no idea. It would just be people who are just practicing responsible business analytics and being good uh, you know, communicating well with each other. And there's all this sort of more values oriented things. Um, <laughs> should they be read together, right? I mean, did you consider it, it should we consider the code of conduct? Well, how should we consider it in, in, in reference to de defying an actuary? Yeah, good question. I think professionalism is a really important aspect of defining what an actuary is. Absolutely agree with you. Um, especially in this day and age as we're battling through some really important questions in the industry and in our profession around things like race and insurance, right? I think professionalism is, is super important in that space. Mm -hmm. um, did you, hmm. I agree that there is also a regulatory aspect of being an actuary as well. And then professionalism pays a very, very big part in that regulatory aspect as well. The actuaries sign off on um, 
opinions, right, and have an arm's length uh, relationship in a lot of ways with the business. And I think that's just something, that is a dichotomy, I think, about the profession that we'll have to work through as we move forward to try to, on one hand, we want to be really innovative and solve business problems using data and analytics. On the other hand, we need to maintain our level of professionalism and at sometimes an arm's length with the business, right, as we work on that aspect. So yes. How do we balance the two? Def defender of the, right, the consumers of financial statements, right? Who, yep. I mean, they're it's a rough go trying to figure out what the heck's going on inside of an insurance company. I mean, especially looking at summary data, the actuaries look at more data than that who sign up on the statements, and you know that's an important part because there's a lot of uncertainty, a huge amount of uncertainty. And uh, one of the things that I like to I like to uh, believe <laughs> is that actuaries actually wind up previewing a lot of the data science issues of the day. So if you study the history of actuaries, you study actually the future of data science. And so one of the things that you'll see there is you see them integrated into business decisions in a deep way, which didn't really happen until well, fairly recently where AI is showing up everywhere. I work for a group of people who are primarily concerned with AI and so do you and so are you. And and so now the business decision is being integrated, right? The current definition that you presented. And then here we come with a lot of questions about values and um, you, can, you can bamboozle people with statistics and with fancy algorithms. And the actuaries come prepackaged with this code of conduct which governs their behavior uh, on these very issues. And you don't have one in the rest of the data science community. So here's the question, should they have one? Should there be a code of conduct for data science practitioners? <laughs> Great question. Look, hmm. practically speaking, I think that'll be a very hard thing to do, right? Uh, okay. Just as there's no good definition for a data scientist, and I'm sure you experience that in your day-to-day -day job. Mm -hmm. um, you can be a data scientist by taking a four-week boot camp, right, and call yourself a data scientist. Um, but I think, so practically, very hard thing to do but as we see in the news every day with all the ethical issues now that arise out of uses of things like AI um, it's a very important topic I don't think a code of conduct is what's going to help in this particular case so do you think does that make you somewhat of a um, skeptic of the actuarial code of conduct like does mm. it then not matter in some way or it, you know, I, I tend to, the data, science, data scientists I meet and I work with, they're upstanding ethical moral people. The actuaries I work with and meet are upstanding moral ethical people, right? Mm -hmm. There's not, I wouldn't say there's a difference between them. And that could be just an argument for maybe David Wright's selection algorithm of colleagues and coworkers and friends is, is what I need. Um, but it could also be an argument for the actuarial code of conduct and not really mattering that much which is, I think we should be allowed to say, right? I mean, it's possible that, that it's superfluous, right? No, it's a I statement it, of, of yeah. you know, fact rather than intent. No, I think, I think it matters tremendously. And our professionalism training and our professionalism continuing education that we have to do every year matters tremendously, as well as our disciplinary uh, procedures as well, right? All of that yeah. is alive and active within the actual profession today, and it is tremendously important. Um, I think I didn't mean to say that Look, I think from a practical point of view, it would be a very hard thing to do on the data science side. I, yes, good in theory, impossible to actually apply in practice, right? There are just so many data scientists and there is no good definition for them, right? We do not have that problem in the actuarial profession. No, we have a society with a president, very capable yeah. one, I've heard. Um, and you know, that is something that binds us together because you could also define an actuary. Maybe we'll just do this whole conversation about defining actuaries, Jessica, because I don't, I don't understand it, honestly. I have lots of ideas. I'm not sure I'm thinking straight about it, but um, you know, we have a, a professional body, mm -hmm. right? And we haven't even talked about exams yet. We're gonna get to exams. There'll be lots of easy questions for you on exams, I promise. Um, but you know, that these are our, these are like a whole bunch of like disparate activities, which can all be could all be applied independently. Like you could, in theory, take the exams and not be an actuary. You mm -hmm. could obey the code of conduct and not be an actuary. You could actually do apply data science and analytical tools to solving insurance company problems and not be an actuary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so none of these, so it's like it's the intersection of these things. I don't know. Uh, 
is this making sense? Why am, should I be confused or should I not be confused about this? What is the confusion? <laughs> well, the confusion is just that none of it seems to be like complete, right? Hmm. It always, it, it all seems to like, you know, we seem to be, like I said, the intersection of these things maybe, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I definitely, it's kind of like one of these things where I know, you know, I know what it means to be part, like, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this feeling I had when I first became an actuary, right? So I started mm -hmm. going to the conferences, right? And Jessica, there's a sense of community, like there really is. You show up and you're, you're, it's like we're part of like a family or something. And there's a real sense of camaraderie. Like I was used to as a reinsurance broker going out, going to conferences and like harassing people, <laughs> trying to get business off of them, take things from them, take their time so that I can make money, right? And an actuarial oil conference is nothing like that. I mean, people are trying to produce business. It's like, it's all like, oh yeah, definitely I'll help you, right? There's, there's like, there's a, um, that really doesn't happen because there's a different culture. And I don't know, I personally don't know how to capture that culture because I think it's real, but I don't know um, where it comes from, you know? What do you think? <laughs> do you agree with the premise? Like you think it is a culture, right? You're nodding, so you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. A third of our members uh, volunteer. It's amazing. Uh, yep, That's which amazing. is, I'm gonna assume, very, very high for, for any organization, right? Yeah. So yeah, you're right. The, the, the community is a really important aspect of what it is to be an actuary. Um, and if you think about it, and I was, I was saying this to my husband, who's not an actuary, right? Like how many, a lot of us still write papers, right? Yeah. I mean, how many just normal working professionals do that on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Volunteer for their professional organization, still write papers. Um, so I think that's something to be very proud of, right? And mm -hmm. something we have to make sure that we we sustain going forward. I think that would be a very hard thing to replicate if we had to do this all over again, right? Yeah. Do you, do you is there have you have like data on the rate of participation? Is it going up or down or steady? Is it? It's pretty stable as far as I no know. No kidding. Yeah. Hmm. And does it tend to be like? Is there is there are there insight into who participates? Are there subsections like older? members or younger members like do you, do we know about who, who are the who are the kind of the super participators yeah yeah we are able to take a look at who is participating throughout the organization so one thing we are noticing is that the newer members are volunteering at a slightly lower rate right so mm -hmm. that's something that we want to get our arms around as well because that is right. not a good trend and how how big of a commitment is is volunteering you know because I, I have some you know, friends of mine who volunteered for um, exam grading, um, that must be a pretty big one. Huge resource load, right? Conferences. Yeah, you're right. So there are various levels. Have you ever volunteered? I don't think so. I've done some round tables, part of like a committee. I was asked to by a friend, but no. You know, I, I was once, uh, I was I was talking to Jim Weiss, guest on the podcast, and um, I was having lunch with him and I uh, said, who's a very active volunteer? And I really admire that in him. And I was like, you know, I haven't really done anything about that. And he said, he made me feel better. He said, well, and I said, you're doing this podcast, but well, that helps people. And I was like, okay, I guess maybe you're right. And for a while I actually had a, um, I actually was producing content for actuaries, um, professional, professionalism. I was like, you know, doing riffs on the precepts. Um, and, and I used to do it at the, in, the, in the intro before every podcast, I would get the, get the guests to read uh, some of the, one of the precepts here, watch, I laminated them all and I was releasing it as like a separate podcast feed of like some like, you know, as famous as somebody comes on the show, reading a precept and talking to me about it during the sound check. But I don't do that anymore because I, this COVID stuff, like, um, you know, I still have sound problems as we, uh, as you learned at the beginning of this, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to support the actual community, but not through formal volunteering mechanisms. I say with some guilt and shame. No worries. <laughs> the podcasts are a great way for you to contribute. That's wonderful. Uh, but yeah, look, you asked a question about you know what it takes to volunteer. Uh, it can look, it varies greatly. But we've recently been trying on some micro volunteering opportunities. Interesting. So one of them that's been super popular is our diversity impact group. So you can volunteer um, in small ways to help the profession in terms of di diversity, equity, and inclusion like volunteering to do an actuarial high school day. We go into high schools, talk to them about the profession, for example. That's a good idea. Uh, how about the absolute level of like entry into the exam process? 
like are those numbers how are they trending up down scale of population any kind of feel for that for the health yeah. of the top of the funnel yep good question we keep growing as a society Amazing. we have a yep. really healthy growth rate and we have had that for a very very long time so i don't know it's like five six seven percent something like that right right so that's very very good um i think we need to understand that more uh why are we growing <laughs> why do you think <laughs> right. we're growing? what's your what's your pet theory i think it's it's always been a very popular profession, and for a very long time it was on the top of the league tables, right, in terms of yeah. the best profession, however you define that. And we're still near the, near the top, I would say. Right. So that's one. Um, mm. I think, look, I chose the profession before, really, before the internet was particularly widely known and used. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to assume since the dawn of the internet, people, more and more people have found out about their actual profession as well and, and made that a career of choice. Um, and then, honestly, David, like, and it, it seems like the PNC insurance community has been able to absorb an ever-growing you know, number of actuaries that we've produced. Right? Um, since I joined, I think the number of actuaries has like doubled or more than doubled. Right? So wh where did they all go? Um, what do they all do? They all do something really rewarding. <laughs> um, so in the next 10, 15 years, if it doubles again, what are they all going to do, right? Hey, you know what? I have a, so, let me, so let me talk about exams for a sec because I have this, I have this like, um, here's like a tough question, which is, do you think the exams are getting, are changing in their difficulty level over time? There is no intention for them to change in their sure. difficulty level over time. Yeah. What is your feeling? I think that they're probably getting harder because, you know, I believe in certain like social psychology research, like the Flynn effect, for example, I think people are getting smarter over time. And I don't think the pass rates are going up on these exams. So I think, and I, and I just sort of had this anecdotal feeling as I was looking at the old exams, they looked way easier. And you would, you, hmm. you know, you would try them out, the games from the 80s and 90s, and it was, much simpler. Sometimes they were different, like there was more kind of fact memorization. This is all from memory. You know, this is a little while ago now that I was doing this, but um, I had this feeling that that they were they were simpler, easier to pass, and they're getting more challenging over time. You know, the advent of you know about six or seven years ago, a lot more you know deliberately complex questions like these Bloom's taxonomy or something it was called. Um, I think that makes them harder, more integrative thinking, and I think that's harder. Um, so that's my sense. What do you think? Yeah, look, yeah, you're right. The direction that over the years we've pushed things to is less rote learning, more integrative thinking, right? It, right? it just mimics the work environment much better. Like no one is gonna ask you to recite things in the appendix of page three or something, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, that's a good trend. Uh, if it has, I don't think it was in a, a work to deliberately make these exams harder to pass. It's in um, our efforts to make sure that the exam process is rigorous and we're actually giving people the skill sets they need to be successful in their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you find that when you were, t is that what you found when you took the exams? Right? So, uh, um, yes, I think I would say that. Uh, I, would, I would say that I think the exams are really good. And, it, you know, here's an interesting like contrast back to the difference between data scientists and actuaries. Where data scientists, they their kind of main mechanism of um, of I don't know what you call it matriculation, right? So like, what is the thing that puts them into the profession? Is the university system, and they take some unobservable, hidden quality, you know, hidden process by which they you know come through this university system and get a PhD often. Um, or something, uh, and then they go, and we don't know what happened to them, right? It's not standardized, and I think that the, I think that, with the actuarial uh, profession not being part of the university system, university system has been very liberating in in being able to actually be incredibly egalitarian. First of all, right? Because uh, anybody can show up and take it, and I didn't even do a math degree in college. I didn't take it in a math class since high school when I did the actuarial exams. So I had to like figure all that out on my own, self study, hundred percent. And uh, it went fine. <laughs> I got through it, at least. 
uh, with some effort, but I would have, you know, I would never have become an actuary had it had you been required to take an actuarial course in a university, never. And I think you're you're really, you know, for an actuary, I'm very diverse actually. I'm not diverse in like a racial sense, right? But I'm diverse in like a cognitive sense because I was a trained salesperson and somebody who avoided math classes because I was scared of them, how hard they were, and and I was kind of right. Um, I eventually worked up the nerve as you know, like a later adult to do do it. And if I had to go back to university, it would have been a deal killer. Would never have done it. Would take it Why did you do it? Because it was, I was very excited about the work. I sat next to actuaries and I was fascinated by what they did and I wanted to do it too. And I also had, so here's a story. I was sitting next to a reinsurance CEO um, a little while ago at like some kind of dinner party or something like that. And he was an actuary, former actuary, now the CEO of this company. And he said to me, um, I asked him, I said, so you moved over from the actuarial side to the underwriting side. I said, why'd you, you know, what precipitated that decision? And he said, yeah, I was looking at those underwriters and he said, you know, I said to myself, they're not smarter than me. And I had the same story. So I was sitting at a bunch of actuaries working and I was like, they're not smarter than me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I was, you know, I mean, turns out they probably were, but they, you know, cause uh, you know, the exams were really hard, but um, I was still able to do the work and I was not in love with the academic material. Like math is like an independent self, you know, sphere of study did not really interest me, but the work that actuaries were doing, I found fascinating. And I loved it. Absolutely. Still love it. It's great. Unusual. So you love the math with a purpose, basically. That's right. Yeah. Without, without a way, without a reason for it, I had no interest in it. And uh, to me, having worked in the business for several years first, that is the thing that gave me the spark to want to pursue it. And again, you know, I think it was a wonderful advantage of the profession, you know, to, it's quite structured uh, to actually find people like me and, and encourage me to, to kind of become like a you know, fully like capable per contributing member of the, of the, of the group. And universities don't have this, right? And so they don't have this exam system and so they're a lot less um, you know, accessible, I think. What do you think? Do you agree? I do agree. Yeah, and we're looking, in, in part of our strategic plan that we rolled out with our Envision Future, we're looking at how to diversify our pipeline. And diversity means a lot of things. It does mean racial diversity, uh, gender diversity, but it also means diversity of thought and our realization that a lot of our members do come through a university system nowadays, right? They, mm -hmm. they sort of study actuarial, they get through a lot of their exams during their actuarial degree. Um, but we also really value people like you who decide to make a career change, who have different backgrounds, right, and can bring different points of view to the table. So I think that's fantastic. I don't know how to attract more people like you. Yeah, I don't know that there is, like, there's nothing specific, right? I wasn't recruited by anybody. Like, I just worked in the business. And, you know, if there's one thing that was, was keeping me out, it was that it was intimidating and that at first I didn't know very many people who had done it, right? And, you know, you, you can look at the actuarial profession and say, you know, they don't look like me, and so I'm not, you know, one of them, where, you know, it's a bunch of math nerds or something like that, right? Um, and I don't, I don't identify as that kind of person uh, with those sort of cognitive traits. Um, but, you know, I didn't, didn't care, <laughs> ultimately, and, you know, when did it, and I thought it was great. Um, and that's, that's, that makes it very accessible. But here, here's like the flip side, and I'll get your reaction to this. I feel like there still remains this kind of undiscovered quality of it. It winds up being a kind of like practitioner discipline as opposed to like a really high status, like everybody went to Harvard kind of thing, um, which maybe you did, I don't know. But uh, you know, I, I think that there's something like linked in society to the, the high status institutions that, that, that we lack. And that, cause we're part of insurance, which is kind of not a high status institution. And then we didn't, you know, there's not like some obvious, like the credentials, a bunch of letters after and nobody understands they're not in the business, right? Within the insurance, it's a high status institution, but in the global sense, it's not, you know, high school kids don't dream of being an actuary unless they read a bunch of books on the nicest professions to work for, you know, 2010. So what do you think about that? Do you agree with that? That that is a challenge? Challenge in terms of our status? Yeah. Attracting talent. Attracting Maybe not talent. since it's happening anyway. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, right? I, I think a lot of smart people who love to use data and analytics to solve business problems are, are choosing other paths, right? That they think might be more interesting, give them more scope. 
so like the data science career path, right? So that's mm -hmm. a very obvious one. So in that respect, it's a challenge. But I would also say that the actual profession is still held in decently high regard, right? I don't know about you. When I tell other people I'm an actuary, actually, I have a choice, right? I go to a dinner party and I can yeah. say I'm an actuary or I'm a data scientist, right? What do I, okay. what do I choose? <laughs> Whatever, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. But um, if I, frankly, either one, if I tell them I'm an actuary, they're very impressed, right? Yeah. Um, you must be very smart, blah, blah, blah. They don't know much about it. They just know I sure. must be very smart. Something, something, right? Um, kind of like I told them if I was a doctor or something, right? Yeah. That, that's yeah, well, the sense I feel. It does sound like you hang out with people who know what actuaries are. Um, I don't, don't know that I do. <laughs> They'll say an accountant? No, I'm not an accountant, but let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. As a, somebody joked to me once, the actuary is like accountants, but without the personality, uh, which is, a, you know, it's not, it's a funny joke, but um, maybe not, a, maybe not a great joke. Um, here, here's another easy question for you, Jessica. Um, what do you think about the CAS SOA merger that didn't happen a year ago? Good question. Can you come up with an argument for or against it? Or both, actually. Can you do, give me one of each well, if you, you, if you dare. With a, you can come up with arguments for both. One thing I want to say is it is not something the leadership or the board is actively discussing, right? Yep. I think when I came into my role as president, um, you know, the way I saw it was this is a question we have talked about in very recent past. I do not plan to rehash this, right? Yep. So that's one. Um, but I can see pros and cons from both both sides of that of that argument right yeah, yeah what would be one sure. of each? look um i am australian right you can probably tell from my accent um i come from a country that had one actuarial uh, organization yeah which made sense to me um and i will admit when i came here i was like oh what's this and what's what's the cas and what is the soa and what is the AAA?" right and so that is obvious level of complexity that we have here in North America. Right? So that's one, one side of the coin. And I paint this in very simple terms. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other side of the coin, we have, as you say, a really valuable community of actuaries within the CAS, right? You go to a conference, you feel immediately at home, accepted, everyone knows each other. Um, it's a really great collegial community that we have built. Right. And we all help each other. And that is something it's probably quite fragile, right? Mm. Um, we have to be careful that we sustain that going forward. So that is a big consideration on the other side. Yeah, I when I was considering it, I was looking forward to, to the debate, which we didn't get a chance to have as a community. And so that that was um, that was too bad because that was it had never occurred to me that that was something that we should even think about, right? Oh, so to me, like the inevitable logic of consolidation, I just don't, I just don't buy it. I, I don't think I, I think that where we see lots of consolidation in in industry, I feel like there's very logical reasons for it, usually to do with enhanced valuations for larger organizations on a multiple basis. So you can buy a company at 8x valuation, and you can value yourself at 12. Um, there's magic there and that just is compelling. Um, and so it doesn't happen for no reason, right? So there has to be a reason. And to me, I just didn't see any reason. Now, as I thought about it more, I started thinking, it, you know, could one reason just be that the leadership of one or the other or both, you know, are just looking to do something, right? Is it just like a purely like an agency cost problem here that they just want to do something and plant their flag? I don't know that that was the case, but I don't think that the, the strong version of the argument was ever really very well articulated. But let me give you how I thought about it. So to me, the only so your point about culture, I think, is is a I like that one. Um, but to me, like the the most massive issue that could ever face the actuaries, actual communities uh, is independence. And I think that if we become more heavily regulated as a profession, that to me is should be our guiding star is to avoid to, to maintain independence and control over the examination process over disciplinary processes over our interactions with state regulators i think that the fragmentation of the actuarial society and the fact that it's under the radar is very deeply linked to the to the fact that regulation is by state in the united states 
and not federal, I think if it was federal, we would be a foregone conclusion. We'd all wind up because it's just easier to interact with one body if you're a federal uh, federal government wants to talk to one person probably, but that's not like that. I think the states aren't quite as stringent about that. Um, and I and I think that independence is the most important thing. So to me, then, if that's true, and that's certainly how I feel, then you have to analyze any kind of movement in the actuarial organization as one, is it moving towards greater independence or away from greater independence? And I could see both in the SCAS SOA merger, because I could see us having a, a stronger lobbying effort, which I think was was mentioned, but not really emphasized in the way that I would have um, with any any government organization. If we were together, we had more resources for lobbying, which I think would probably work to preserve our independence. But then again, it might put our head up above the parapet, right? So now, oh, they're all a one big unified group of actuaries. Now we have a throat to choke, right? And mm. we could we could be a target for all sorts of special interests and whatnot. Um, and then that would inevitably slide us down to greater regulation. And so I, I in the end, didn't get a chance to have this debate with anybody. Uh, I'm not asking you to debate these points uh, either. Uh, maybe it'll get proposed again someday and we can have this debate. But I think that at least the framing of actuarial independence being the most important thing is, is something that I didn't see discussed as widely as I would have liked. Do you have a reaction though? <laughs> No, I hear you. I think that is an important point to keep in mind. And if you look at what's happened to other societies over the years, and, and not that I'm a great historian either, there has, there has been something, the independence part has been something that has evolved, right, in other countries like the UK and Australia. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we need to be mindful of, right? That is, you're right, probably not completely top of mind all the time because it's not an issue that has been that front and center in the US. It's the water we swim in, right? We, I mean, it's incredible that that there isn't like a. If I remember, I sat through a talk once at one of the uh, CAS meetings where there was a presenter talking about how exactly states define an actuary, or and it's fuzzy. Like there's like there's not a lot of because you can sign off on financial statements if you're an ACAS under certain circumstances, and there's all sorts of like weird legacy uh, definition criteria that get involved in, in like who actually can perform the acts that are supposed to be performed by an actuary. It's like a little bit of a mess. And it's actually, it seems to me that there is this, everybody's okay with not really asking too many questions about it because it's working. It's not not working. There haven't been, a, there hasn't been a huge rash of insolvencies, right? There hasn't been like, a, there's no witch hunt out to look for whoever yeah. signed off on the finishing of various actuaries. And as long as that state continues, state of affairs continues, then then this mess we're kind of looking at right now, kind of hard to see who loses, right? Why make why make the change? And anything that like disrupts that equilibrium to me is is kind of terrifying. So I'm like a deeply conservative actuary. You can see like, that politically. Most, yes. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. You said we, we, most most actuaries aren't like me. You think they want to make changes? No, 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 no. Most actuaries are very risk averse. Let's go with that. I'll say, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm on board with that. You know, um, I'm fully on, on board with that. Um, so tell me about like we haven't even talked about your presidency at the CS. So tell me some things you wanted to accomplish. You want to accomplish? What are you working on? Um, what what are uh, what are your priorities? Great question. Look. Uh, my priorities center around the three-year plan that we rolled out in November last year, along with that Envision of Future. It is our strategic plan of what we want to do over the next three years to move us towards our Envision Future, right? Mm -hmm. So it has four parts to it. One is building skills for the future. Two is developing our pipeline. Three is growing internationally. And then number four is making sure we have an operating model that can support those first three things. Okay. Right? So. Do you want me to go through each of them? I do. I do. <laughs> okay. I do. Can, can you tell me first, was this a plan that you inherited, inherited, or was it one that you developed or involved in developing? Like, is this something that's bigger than just your, your kind of um, um, office holding period? Yeah, good question. So I held a board retreat when I was president-elect. This is the, what each president-elect does. And I okay. used it to get the board together to develop the, an outline of this strategic plan, our strategic plan of the next three years. Um, it was actually, a, it was a lot of fun. Um, and these are the 
four areas that we all agreed we wanted to work on uh, that would move us towards that envisioned future. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And how long is the term of the president? Uh, so this is how it works. So you're, when you agree to do this, you're on for a three-year three -ish year term. So okay. your president-elect, then your president, and then your chair of the board. Okay. Yeah. One year each. Yep. So you will have begun a three-year implementation in year two of your tenure? Yes. So of your this, yep, yep. So year one is when the year I'm president, basically, yep. this three-year plan. Yeah. Right. And then so your successor will need to be on board with this plan. Yes. I guess. <laughs> right. Yes. And yes. you already know who your successor is. Yes. Who, and Kathy is? was yeah. there when we did this board retreat. So that's okay. very good. <laughs> right. So that's handy. So yeah, so let's go into some detail then. What are you doing exactly to um, further these goals? The yeah, great question. So building skills for the future is an exciting one. So that's talking about the actuary of the future and what skills they need. Yep. Right? Both so we're talking about basic ed but also continuing ed. And we're thinking the actuary of the future has three core skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. So one is analytics and the kind like whatever analytics you need to solve the important insurance questions of, of the future, that's the analytics we need our members to know. So that will right. mean advanced analytics, right? Yep. Number two, business problem solving. I think we need to up our skills there in, in a pretty big way. So the, the, from my viewpoint, as we have more big data, right? As, as data gets bigger, as analytics in, grows as a skill set, there are going to be more and more new problems that you can solve with data and analytics that you couldn't solve before. So what I find is actors are good at solving the traditional problems, reserving, pricing, etc. right? And we're sort of given a book, a step by step, how to do these things. What about the new problems that you can now solve with data and analytics, right? That is, that's been very challenging, I'll say, for me and my team. And you do need to really up your skills in terms of problem solving in order to be successful in that space. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem solving. And then number three is just the domain knowledge, which for us is PNC insurance. So we are thinking the actor of the future with those three skill sets, that's, that's really the vision, right? And I used to call it, <laughs> that's the unicorn we're after. Yep. But then I think, you know, the, 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 the CAS uh, marketing staff were like, you know, unicorns don't exist, Jessica, stop, stop saying that word. <laughs> but they do, so they're billion the, dollar. <laughs> yes. Funny. Um, Interesting. So I want to, you, you, you published a, or you're part of a presentation that I found when I was doing some research for this, um, where you're talking about the, uh, the progress in analytical tools, um, did with Don Mango and other gentlemen, I forgot, I forgot their name. Um, but that was an interesting presentation where, you know, I think that it opened with a kind of like lament about, or this question of whether or not things had advanced, and then you proceeded to present all kinds of interesting advances. Uh, I think in analytical tools, um, and I'm wondering what you think the state of it is now, of, of vectorial tools, because there's always this, there's always this, I guess, uh, irony maybe in that we had developed analytical tools that are very sophisticated, but most most actuaries use basic triangles and point of comparison, um, still. Um, and I'm wondering what you know that was probably like eight or nine years ago. I think you might have given that presentation. So in 2021. What do you think about the state of the sophistication of the tool kit? Of the actuarial tool kit or yeah. of the wider tool kit that you could use to solve insurance problems? Or both? Uh, both, yeah. <laughs> sure. Look, I mean, if I just think about the work me and my team do today, it has even in, so I've been at Zurich for six and a half years. And in that time, there are things we couldn't do when I first joined that we totally can do now. Okay. So it is like changing. What? Um, like implementing things around image recognition, for example. Okay. Right? Uh, just frankly having the raw computing power to actually implement it, having the open source code to frankly do it pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, all of those are becoming more and more of reality, right? Or things around natural language processing right? and the development of tools like, you know, GPT-3. All of these things things that are happening in the broader analytical space, it's moving really, really quickly. Yep. And companies, or at least my company, is taking advantage of, 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 of all of that. 
So and I think it's really interesting. Those aren't reserving techniques, I don't think. Correct. That'd be pretty cool if you could. Um, pretty interesting, well, anyway. That could be. I, yeah, I was just thinking, <laughs> as I said it, I was like, mm, I could probably imagine some really interesting ideas, experiments. But on how about within the actuarial? Well, let's say you know insurance analytical toolkit, things actuaries would use in their day job as an actuary. How about the state of innovation or advance in those tools? Great question. So, hmm. look, more and more predictive analytics is, is getting into the toolkit of the actuary from a day-to-day -day basis, right? So even just simple things like basic multivariate GLMs, right? We're seeing that used more on a day-to-day -day basis for, yep. for actuaries. And I think that that is a step in the right direction Right? But we do mm -hmm. need to go to go further for, for an actuary and their toolkit. So that's something we're talking about as we think about the exams as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was amazed when I took the exams. This is like more than 10 years ago, I guess, uh, when I was doing it. But um, that that there was no uh, no programming. There is now. There has been since. And um, I think the very last exam I took did have some stuff on GLMs, um, you know, like serious work on GLMs in it. Um, and uh, I was just kind of amazed that it hadn't hit yet and it kind of was starting to kind of flow through. But I, you know, I feel like there's a, there's a challenge in the data that actuaries use with that doesn't really, doesn't really help to have more tools because the data so, can be so limited, you know? Um, and, and I'm wondering whether that's just sort of the constraining factor is that unless the data changes, why would we need new tools? Yep, yep. I think data is probably one of the big opportunity areas for all the various players in the insurance space right today. If I think about what holds us back, at least of my team, it will be the data more than anything else, right? We have the analytical capabilities, but what about the data? So I completely agree with you. Particularly, like you played in the reinsurance space, absolutely. Um, commercial insurance space, absolutely, right? And, you know, I think there was this kind of revolution that broke over the actuarial community when the um, in the late 80s, I think it was, when they started, when they, the creation of Schedule P, right? Suddenly you had this publicly available data set of, of actuarial triangles, right? So I'm wondering if it's like within your, it's in your minds to lobby the, the NAIC to compel companies to disclose more data in the, in the annual statement. Because that would be one way to get it into the system. Then you're forced. Very to. interesting. No, <laughs> but, right. um, I don't know how the Schedule P, like how that came about in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I um, it was a paper. It was is listed in one of the in an exam. I guess it's six. Is it um, the one that's on the regulatory stuff? There's a little bit, little paragraph of history on it. Um, Feldblum, Shalom Feldblum, and I think it's him. And it says that there is a huge effort that was underway, and I might have supplemented this with some other research I've done, uh, just because I love this stuff. Uh, There's hu huge controversy about, and you can imagine the companies, right, the insurance companies, not being terribly happy about this. But in the wake of the liability crisis, think of the think of the, like the regulatory political environment for insurance companies then. If that happened now, I'd be terrified of the, for the independence of the actuarial society. If you had a legit economic. You know, your pain felt by average people because the reserves were inadequate at insurance companies. It would be a big problem for us. Um, but and then they did. And one of the responses was Schedule P. They said, we got to be able to evaluate these companies. And in, in the late 80s was when that came about. And I think it was launched in the early 90s. The Schedule P was uh, the very first thing to be forced, you know, forcing organizations to disclose that, you know, pretty intimate information about their business. Right? I mean, Schedule P is a gold mine. I mean, it is incredible how much data you can get out of there. Um, and so it seems to me like, you know, I, I don't know, I wonder what kind of tools most actuaries use before Schedule P. They probably used, I wonder if it was a similar kind of like, you know, we're thinking now about Bornhardt or Ferguson, when back then they might have been, you know, that might have been the machine learning of the day. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, man, if only we had better data, we could use that, um, perhaps. What would be the data you would want from every insurance company? So you're now working inside a big insurance company. If there's like a data item that you could, you could, um, you could get. If I don't know, like if you're a reinsurance company, right? What would it be? Do you think? 
I have an idea. Yeah, good question. I'll give you mine. You go first. What is? No, no, go. <laughs> mine would be very detailed exposure data. Exposure data to me is the key. Oh, interesting. Um, I think that that's very poor, very poorly maintained because um, it's not used for many things. If it's revenues, you could sort of imagine it being the case, but you know, whatever their driver is of a rating algorithm, um, that would be, I think that would unlock a lot of innovation because it's like, you know, it's big data. Hmm. Yeah, good question. I think, look, I actually think claims data is one of the most important strategic data assets that an insurance company at least carries today. Because yeah. you know what, you can actually buy the exposure data, right? Sure. Like if you wanted to find out something about various companies or whatever it is you're insuring, you could buy that, right? Um, probably for a price. Whereas for the claims data, usually you can't. Right? Yeah. You, you buy it by paying for the claims. <laughs> Right. Can be very expensive. So um, it, and if I think about, like, we get approached by insure techs, and the one time they ever want to actually work with us to develop things is because they want access to our claims data. That is the one thing they cannot buy. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good point. I think your answer is better than mine. Um, okay, so we're out of time, Jessica. Do you have any asks of the audience? What could you, if you could, what, what would you, any closing thoughts on on um, on your mind today? No, <laughs> I just want to thank you, David. This Volunteer great... for the CAS, <laughs> right? How about that? I'll do that for you because I think people should do that more or start a podcast. <laughs> sure, volunteer. <laughs> if you're a CAS member, definitely volunteer. Great. But it's been a pleasure, David. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jessica. My guest today is Jessica Leong. Thanks a lot much. Great. Okay, man, that was.